let me just say this is that this is okay thank you uh for let's thank uh, joe for uh starting the recording um and so it, it is my great pleasure today to introduce tom odell uh, to the Joint Seminars of Neuroscience. But before I go forward, let me just add, um, this is the last of the BRI Endowed Chair Speakers as part of this series that we're going to host. Uh, the next iteration of this I've, asked, I've been asked on behalf of Felix to mention is that the uh, integrative centers are going to be presenting talks. We have uh, an August 11th talk already scheduled for the Integrative Center of Addictive Disorders, uh, but we are scheduling others too. Um, it seems that there won't be a talk as early as next week, but uh, we are expecting them certainly before August 11th. And in the fall, the plan is to resume with the joint seminars in neuroscience uh, with, with the schedule that's going to be looked at by the committee. So with that in mind, um, it is really with great pleasure that I'm introducing Tom O'Dell today. Um, Tom started off uh, as a psychology major in Pennsylvania before doing his graduate work uh, with Burgess Christensen at, at the University of Texas Graduate School in Biomedical Sciences in Galveston, the Department of Bio, uh, uh, Physiology and Biophysics there. Um, there he was interested in the glutamate receptors that are expressed in horizontal cells, which provide the horizontal feedback for uh, lateral inhibition. And it's that interest in glutamate receptors that carried him to a short postdoc with Bradley Alger at the University of Maryland before he ended up with Eric Kandel at, uh, at Columbia University. And it's really the work with Eric, when you go back and look through Tom's CV, that, you, that becomes obvious that his long-term interests have been really shaped by uh, trying to understand the cellular mechanisms that understand that underlie uh, the long-term potentiation of synapses. The long-term potentiation of synapses in the hippocampus, of course, um, is now widely to, uh, believed to underlie learning and the, and the formation and consolidation of memories. Uh, this work uh, eventually led Tom to his own laboratory here at UCLA, where he's been since 1993. And he's going to be talking a lot about uh, that work in the context of, of uh, the, the presentation he's going to be giving today. Um, however, what I would like to do is I would like to take a second here to acknowledge Tom's enormous uh, impact on the training of our young people. And I think this, this is a part that we really owe him an enormous debt of gratitude as a commu community. Um, since he's come to UCLA, um, he's trained 11 PhD students. He served on 52 dissertation committees and still is on six current committees. Right? He, he's been uh, uh, a um, director for the Cellular Neurobiology Training Program for a 10 year period. He's also now the uh, vice chair for the Neuroscience IDP. He serves as the associate director of education for the Brain Research Institute, currently sits on graduate council. He's responsible now uh, for uh, the cellular neurophysiology neuro class that was taken over from Gordon, Gordon Fain. Um, and so he, he's really at the, in the center of the educational and training efforts on behalf of all of our students and our postdocs. And I think for that, Again, I think we owe him a huge debt of gratitude and a clap. So uh, without any further ado, um, uh, Tom is the Gail Patrick Endowed Administrative Chair in Brain Research, and he will be telling us about his, his work today. Let me add just one more thing. Uh, please, um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them into the chat. Uh, at the very end of the talk, um, we'll be fielding questions. If you have a question at the end of the talk, if you click on, um, I believe the tab is participants, there is a blue raise hand. Uh, and then at the end of the talk, we can, you can ask Tom questions directly by raising your hand and Joe will unmute you to ask your question. Okay, everybody can see that okay, I hope. So uh, I think everybody that knows me knows that I still do experiments. I do experiments. I'm at my rig every chance I get. And last summer, I had the best summer last summer. You know, summers are quiet. There's no teaching, few committee meetings. And I was at the rig like every day for three months. And so what I'm going to tell you about today was basically my summer project from last summer when I started a, a new project in the lab. And 
you can tell from the title of my talk that it's about neo, something called neo Hebbian LTP. Before diving into that, I want to talk a little bit about just Hebbian LTP, which I think many, many of you are familiar with. But this is the idea that coincident pre and postsynaptic activity at the synapse engages signaling mechanisms that can produce a persistent, prolonged increase in the strength of synaptic transmission, a process known as long term potentiation or LTP. And if you look at the first plot that's shown here, this was actually experiments done by a graduate student in the lab long ago, Harley, Holly Carlisle. And what she was doing was doing current clamp recordings, uh, patch clamp recordings from single CA1 pyramidal cells. And she'd activate presynaptic inputs onto those cells once a minute or so, record the excitatory postsynaptic potentials that were generated, the EPSPs. And then after a 10 minute baseline, what she did was to pair that presynaptic activity with current injection through the recording electrode to trigger off a little burst of action potentials in the postsynaptic cell. And when that pairing was done, she did it, I think, 100 times, uh, and then went back to just testing the synapses once a minute or so. And you can see in these blue symbols here that the synapse is strongly and persistently potentiated. Here's an example of these excitatory postsynaptic potentials or EPSPs during baseline and then at the end of the experiment after that sort of pairing protocol. Now that's heavy in LTP and it's called heavy and because it sort of fits the properties of a, of a mechanism of memory formation proposed by Donald Head very long ago, back in the 40s. And his idea was coincident pre and post synaptic activity engages mechanisms that strengthen synapses and store information. The timing is really tight for heavy in forms of LTP. You can see these experiments here in the, the, the gray symbols. What Holly did in these experiments was just a delay the postsynaptic depolarization by 50 milliseconds, and you can see LTP is completely gone. So it's really coincident on a 10 millisecond time scale that you need to induce long term potentiation or heavy in LTP. Now, there's been years of work using pharmacological approaches and genetic manipulations, looking at things that disrupt LTP. And in general, they also disrupt, disrupt associative forms of learning. And so it's widely accepted that long-term potentiation, heavy in LTP, is an important mechanism that's used during behavioral learning. There are some problems, though. And a good example that sort of highlights two of the problems I want to talk about is shown here. These are some experiments that were done in Wolfram Schultz's lab, uh, looking at learning in monkeys and presenting a visual stimulus on a screen and then a second and a half later, delivering a juice reward. And so it's a simple associative learning task. What you're seeing here is different trials are all stacked on top of one another. Each little bar represents the animal licking at a tube that's delivering a juice reward. And you can see in this experiment, this animal's well-trained, it sees that visual stimulus, and it's, you see this anticipatory uh, licking, it knows reward is coming, right? Here's one of the problems. Right? The time difference between the visual stimulus and the reward is one and a half seconds. You know, if we come back to our heavy and LTP and think of the time difference between presynaptic activity, which might be you know, processing as visual information, and postsynaptic activity triggered by a reward, the time just doesn't work. Right? Heavy and LTP works on millisecond time scales. Behavioral associative learning works on seconds or more. The other problem is shown here. Here's another component of this learning task. And that is after the animals have been well trained, a second visual stimulus, a compound stimulus now is being presented. This is novel. The old one was presented. You keep training and training and training. So the animals, you can see this anticipatory licking, right? They know the reward is coming. Here's the kicker. If you now, after that training, come back and show just this novel stimulus, the animal shows absolutely, essentially no response at all. Right. This is the well-known blocking phenomenon that was discovered by Kamen back in, I don't know, 68 or 69. And the idea is, is that what drives learning, associative learning, is sort of error prediction. Something surprising, unpredicted happens, and that provides a signal to cause, to trigger, to trigger associations between cues and rewards as in this particular case. So here, the reward was completely predicted, predicted by the stimulus that the animals had prior learning to, and so no learning took place. Now, I won't go through the rest of this experiment, but the bottom line is it's kind of difficult to take a heavy in plasticity rule and somehow get prediction error uh, into the mechanism, right? It's a simple coincidence-based plasticity rule. Now, some people look at that distinction between 
between behavioral learning and the properties of heavy and LTP and say, well, obviously LTP can't be a mechanism of learning. It doesn't show these fundamental properties of behavioral learning. Actually, uh, Randy Gallistol is the one who's pr probably written the most about that. I think I saw Art Arnold's on, on the seminar. I remember when Art was chair of the neuroscience IDP, Randy was here at UCLA and Art thought, oh, wouldn't it be great to get Tom and Randy to do a seminar course for the graduate students where they argue about whether LTP is a mechanism of learning and memory. I was the new assistant professor when that happened, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I learned a lot from Randy, and we never ended up agreeing whether or not LTP uh, was a mechanism of learning. So that's one way of looking at it. A second way of looking at it is that, well, you don't have to have the synapse do everything, right? Their synapses connect neurons together into circuits, which then talk to other circuits in different regions of the brain. And these things like, are these problems like time and the role of prediction errors and driving associative learning, that's a circuit mechanism, right? And I've always believed that. I mean, it, 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 it seems like it's a bit of hand waving to just explain away things that, that you really can't explain. But there is evidence that that's actually the case. Actually, Michael Fanslow, years ago, did some really nice experiments in uh, fear conditioning, showing that circuit properties can actually produce this kind of blocking effect. There's a third idea out there, and that's the one I want to talk about today. And this is this idea of neo heavian plasticity. It's an old idea. I think the very first description I know came from Crow back in 1968. And it's referred to as neo heavian, or at least recently people are calling this idea neo heavian, because it's at its heart, it's a heavy in form of plasticity, where you have a presynaptic cell firing action potentials, a postsynaptic cell being active right after. So here you have that coincidence that's in heavy in learning rules. But the idea is that that enough, or that alone, is not enough to trigger synaptic strengthening, to trigger LTP. And you can see this line along here is tracking synaptic strength. This comes from a modeling study by Eugene Zikovich a number of years ago. You can see there's no change in synaptic strength. The idea is you need three factors pre-activity, post-activity, and a third factor that's related to novelty, reward, punishment, a prediction error. And here the idea is that modulatory neurotransmitter like dopamine or norepinephrine can come along. And when you've had the heavy component and this reward or error prediction related component, now synapses will change their strength. Right? A key part of this idea, these neo hebbian plasticity rules, is that what the heavy component does is to induce what's called an eligibility trace. That's a change at the synapse. It's not reflected in the strength of the synapse, but it's making a change at the synapse that makes it eligible to respond to the signal related to reward, error prediction, and punishment, or whatnot. And now these synapses are eligible if that third factor comes along. So you can see these three factor neo and plasticity rules uh, they solve the problem of incorporating error prediction into learning at the synapse. And also because of the duration of these eligibility traces that you know, can last in this model, at least for a couple of seconds, they kind of help expand the time course of heavy and LTP out of the millisecond range and over now onto many seconds. Now this idea is old, it's been around forever, but recently a number of labs have started to get interested in this. Uh, Ole Paulson, Alfredo Kirkwood, and others looking at cortical pyramidal cells and hippocampal pyramidal cells have found processes, changes in synaptic strength that very closely mimic this. The other thing that's happened even more recently is this idea that this sort of third factor, you know, here it's a, a modulatory neurotransmitter. Blake Richards and Timothy Lillicrap published a paper a couple of years ago arguing that and it's based on a modeling study that other regions of the brain that have information about errors or punishments or reward can actually feed back onto pyramidal cells through synapses located on the apical dendrites and when they do that when that information arises it can trigger depolarization activated activations of voltage activated calcium channels and trigger a plateau potential in the dendrite that's what's shown in the screen line here they get a long lasting active response from the dendrite that in turn at the soma triggers off what's known as a complex spike burst. And their idea was this kind of unique signature of action potential firing, the complex spike burst, could be another type of error signal that could work through these three factor plasticity rules. And at right about the same time, work in Jeff McGee's lab found that that's actually the case. Working in hippocampus, looking at place cell formation, uh, in animals as they're navigating through a novel environment. He found, uh, Jeff's lab found, that these complex spike bursting and dendritic plateau potentials could produce a form of LTP that was able to gap 
or, or, or where synapses could potentiate over delays of, of several seconds. So back at the beginning of the summer, I was interested in these ideas and thought uh, it would be fun project to sort of look into this more. And one of the main motivations for that, and here Shakay will recognize this. In my lab, we've been studying the induction of LTP by postsynaptic complex spike bursting for, I don't know, 20 years or so. And we always thought we were looking at heavy in LTP, that the bursts were just providing depolarization than you did for NMDA receptor activation and LTP induction. I started thinking that maybe we're actually studying this neohebian form of plasticity. So I'm just going to show you a few things. I'll go through some of this quicker than I plan to, since I don't want to run out of time. But here's one of sort of our basic experiments. We're recording from the hippocampal slice. We're using two stimulating electrodes to activate independent groups of synapses, uh, forming synapses under a common pool of, of postsynaptic neurons. We're using extracellular recordings with an, a recording electrode stuck in the dendritic layer of the CA1 region of the hippocampus. So we're looking at field excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And after getting a baseline, what we did here, or what I did here at time zero, was just to give a brief train, 15 seconds, of theta frequency stimulation. So single pulses at five hertz, right? Did nothing on this other pathway, this other group of synapses. And what you can see is after that, you get nice long-term potentiation at the synapses that got the theta frequency stimulation. And it's synapse specific. These guys, a little bit of heterosynaptic depression, but they don't undergo LTP. So we've been looking at this forever. And I remember when we first started doing these things, it was, how is the NMDA receptor getting activated when it's five hertz, right? Five hertz stimulation, it doesn't give you a lot of sort of temporal summation of EPSPs to produce a strong depolarization to turn on NMDA receptors and, and trigger LTP induction. But if you look at what happens during the train, you get a real clue as to what's happening. So what I had is a little movie. You can actually see an experiment unfold as the way I would see it in the lab. Here's one of these extracellular recordings of a excitatory postsynaptic potential. There's a shock artifact here. Here's the EPSP itself. And I'll just start this, and it'll just show the responses during one of these trains. And you'll see what happens. So there's facilitation right at the start. The response get bigger, gets bigger. But then you start to see these spikes developing on the waveform. And they'll persist. They take a while to get going, but they'll persist now throughout the, the entirety of the train. So they're negative going spikes recorded in stratum radionum, the dendritic layer of, of CA1. So we've, for years, just called these dendritic population spikes, populations because we're recording from a group of cells using extracellular recording techniques. And the idea was that this sort of dendritic bursting was responsible for providing the depolarization to allow this sort of stimulation protocol to induce LTP. Now, whenever I show these sorts of responses to other people, they don't buy that. They're like, well, that's just weird. I don't know what's going on there, right? What these things really are. It's actually an easy question to address. I've done some experiments using whole cell current clamp recordings from single CA1 parameter cells. Give one of these five hertz trains for 15 minutes. So now we're looking at, you know, sort of conventional electrophysiology of the responses, how they change in a single cell over time. And you can see the EPSPs facilitate, start to trigger a spike, and then with time transition into this burst firing mode. Now, I won't bore you with all the analysis that's shown here. All this is just meant to show that this sort of bursting that occurs very closely, essentially, is identical to complex spike bursting that occurs in pyramidal cells in vivo, based on work done by Albert Lee and Arthur Conerth and, and others. So it's really complex spike bursting that's getting initiated to trigger LTP induction. Now, I don't want to belabor this because I want to get into what I think is the more interesting stuff. I'm just going to talk about this particular portion of this slide. This is looking at experiments done with a longer train of 5 hertz stimulation. And what's being plotted here, of course, that induces long-term potentiation, nothing on the pathway that or synapses that weren't activated, uh, except for this heterosynaptic depression. And what's shown here is just the development of these negative going population spikes as the stimulation the five hertz stimulation goes through this 30 second train, right? And you can see sort of the activity dependent buildup. It takes about 10 seconds or so before the spikes really get going. They're firmly established at 15 seconds. And then at 30 seconds, the cells have experienced a long bout of EPSP evoked bursting. So I'm gonna skip through the, the next slides or the next portions of the slide. The idea being is that it's just evidence showing that this bursting is responsible for LTP induction. And in particular, I just want to note this guy. So do experiments where you just 
stop the train at five seconds, five hertz for five seconds, verse hadn't started and you get no potentiation at all. You get a little longer, you get more and more of this complex spike bursting and more and more LTP. So what about neo heavying Could these bursts, are they just providing depolarization that enables heavy in LTP? Or is there something else happening at these synapses during these bouts of EPSP evoked complex spike bursting? So here's the first experiment I did to sort of test that idea. And that was, again, to use two stimulating electrodes to activate distinct or separate populations of excitatory synapses onto CA1 pyramidal cells. And the idea was to all right, let's give one set of synapses enough stimulation, 15 seconds of theta frequency stimulation to transition the postsynaptic cell into that complex spike bursting state and then stop and immediately go to the independent second set of synapses and ask, do they have to start all over again to build up to produce bursting or can they take advantage of the work done by this other bout of activity and immediately start to burst? So here again is one of these movies. This is just the control. So five seconds of stimulation here alone on these pathways. This is kind of boring to see the response facilitates and then not much happens. The train simply doesn't go on long enough for this activity dependent transition into the bursting mode to, 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 to occur. Now here, we're gonna look at the same thing with these synapses they're doing after another group of synapses has been activated for 15 seconds. So now we're into the post bursting mode and you can see immediately these synapses jump right into that complex spike bursting mode. Right? So they're sort of sharing, it's not synapse specific. It's like this complex spike bursting mode is a, a cell wide phenomenon. Once one group group of synapses engage that bursting mode of firing, other synapses can take advantage of it. And you can imagine if you ask, well, what's the LTP? No bursting here. And you can see short-term potentiation of these synapses when they're activated by themselves. But if they were able to take advantage of this complex spike bursting mode that was induced by other synapses, they show robust LTP. Right. So there's sort of cooperativity going on between different synapses that's mediated by this complex spike bursting mode. Now I did a bunch of experiments to sort of map that out, just varying the duration of how long those S1 synapses were active, five seconds or 10 seconds. And the idea being, you know, as we get more and more activity, that should get us closer and closer to the point where the cells are bursting. And now when the S2 synapses are active, they'll burst and they'll undergo LTP. And that's what you're seeing here. So 10 seconds, that gets us right to the threshold for bursting. So we've gotten the cells to that point. And now if the S2 synapses become active, they burst and you get nice LTP. What I'm showing in these histograms are just the sort of the percentage. It's showing the distribution of EPSPs that have zero, one, two, or three of these population spikes. And this little value here, the complex spike index, it's just the percent of EPSPs during that whole train, during this guy, that actually produce two or more of these population spikes, dendritic spikes. So that all is making sense. Here's the kicker, right? did an experiment where I actually did a very long train, 25 seconds worth of stimulation on S1. So now there's been lots of complex spike bursting, right? And I expected these second group of synapses when they were activated show, should show continued bursting and lots of LTP, and they don't, right? You can see in the histogram, the bursting's okay. It's not as strong as it is here, but still lots of the EPSPs are bursting, but there's no potentiation at all. So this summary graph here is just showing a point plot with the results from all the experiments. The line is connecting the mean values. And you can see the synapses kind of cooperate, different synapses cooperate with one another, transitioning into this complex spike or bursting mode. But then when one group of synapses really has the most intense stimulation, the longest bout of stimulation, there's some competitive mechanism that kicks in and they grab all the strength, all the associative strength. There's a competition and these guys, this other set of synapses, undergo no change in synaptic strength. I, I kind of think I know what's going on there. I'm interested in it because it's kind of a mechanism of overshadowing where one stimulus is very, very intense and it blocks changes or associations in response to a, a weaker stimulus. That's something you see in associative learning. It's kind of very reminiscent of that. You can see that these responses are much smaller than these responses. This was just overlaid field EPSPs recorded during baseline and at the end of the experiment. And during the train, there's a pronounced inhibition of the excitatory potentials produced by S2. And that's what's being plotted here. So for the five seconds, 10 seconds, or 25 seconds on S1, here's what happens when you activate the S2 synapses. 
And you can see following a long bout of complex spike bursting, there's this heterosynaptic mechanism that turns on. And I think this is limiting excitatory synaptic drive, and that's accounting for the lack of potentiation that's occurring here. The mechanisms of that, I have no idea, but it'll be fun to work that out, figure out what's going on here, and if I can manipulate it to see whether I can open up this sort of window here for these cooperative and competitive interactions between the synapses during LTP induction. Now, you can see in these experiments, all I've done is, you know, second set of synapses always gets activated right after the end of the train on the first set of synapses. So it was kind of an obvious next step to ask, well, okay, there's this activity dependent buildup into the complex spike bursting state, but how long does that last? Does it go away right away or does it decay as a function of time? And to look at that, I did this experiment, which was, you know, we've seen this before, same sort of thing, activating one group of synapses using this 10 seconds of stimulation. So we're driving the cell right up to the point where now it's gonna start bursting and then introduce a gap just wait, in this case, four seconds before activating these S2 synapses. And the question is, do these guys burst or is it all over by that point in time? But here's another one of these movies. I'll just let it roll. It starts out showing what's happening on S1. You'll see the gap and then you'll see what happens when we return and activate this independent pool or group of synapses. So there's that initial facilitation that occurs. And you can see it's taking time, but here comes one of those population spikes. Now at eight seconds, the first thing's occurring, it's well established, and then we wait. And boom, when we turn on this set of synapses, they jump right into that bursting state, even with a four second delay. The first time I saw that, I just I gasped out loud. The second time I saw it, I couldn't help but laugh. And I know that sounds really, I'm geeking out on my data, but you know, I worked on horizontal cells, glutamate receptor ion channels, and doing a lot of biophysics and looking at mean channel open times and recording you know, time constants of excitatory postsynaptic current decay and looking at LTP. Everything I've done in my scientific career has been in the millisecond. That's where I live, right? A couple of milliseconds to 10 milliseconds. That four second gap feels like forever, right? So sorry about that. Um, but as you can imagine, there's that bursting, and you can see here's just the LTP plot for that experiment. So you get robust long-term potentiation on these synapses, even with a gap, even with a delay. Right? I've done a bunch, or did a bunch of experiments just varying that interval. And you can see, you can take it all the way out. You can separate these two bouts of theta activity on the synapses out to six seconds, and you still get significant potentiation compared to what would happen with just five seconds on that pathway alone. As you get out to an eight second separation between them, right, the bursting starts to fade. So the responses here are showing bursting during this bout of, of stimulation on S2. Here you can see this complex spike index, only well, less than half of the EPSPs are inter causing a burst and the potentiation starts to go away. So, you know, we're moving away from the tight millisecond, tens of millisecond timing requirement for LTP induction for in he heavy in plasticity rules, and instead seeing things that operate on the, on the time course of several seconds on a behavioral time scale. One other experiment I did is this, you know, this is just one bout, just one time, 10 seconds here, five seconds here, separate them by eight seconds and not much happens. And I thought, what if I just repeated it a second time? And that's what's shown here. So I introduced a 15 second gap. This is sort of like repetitive training, right? Put a 15 second gap in and repeated, and now it works. Now I get nice bursting or see nice bursting during the second bout of theta stimulation and get nice LTP on both pathways. Okay. You might know, wonder where I got that 15 seconds from. Actually, that's from Jeff McGee's experiments. They were looking at place cell formation in rats running on a circular track and it would take them 15 seconds to do a lap. And whenever they, a cell, a parameter cell, whenever the animal would enter the place field of that cell, you start to see complex spike bursting occurring, occurring on that sort of time scale. So that's where that number comes from. So there's a lot of work to do to map this sort of thing out. But I suspect that this time interval between the synapses can be bridged or spread out even further, right, even longer, with repetitive stimulation like the one that's shown here. Now here's. I was just going to say, here's where the experiments get a little weird, but I think many of you may be thinking they're already a little weird. I wanted to make the pattern a little bit more complex, move away from just doubles, right? One here, one there, kind of uh, bouts of activity at two groups of synapses. So I used sort of a triplet stimulation protocol, where I did five seconds on one pathway, switched over to the S2 synapses, and then returned 
to the first pathway, right? So it's a little triplet stimulation. These are just control experiments for, you know, five seconds alone on one pathway. Here's a double applied to the same pathway with a five second interval, not much happening. Here's a doublet distributed over two groups of synapses. Again, not much happening, not much LTP. But, you know, as I'm kind of thinking in these experiments, all right, total time of theta frequency stimulation is 15 seconds. There should be nice bursting here. These S1 synapses should potentiate. And you can see they do, right? Here's the responses during this last train. There's lots of bursting going on. Here's that complex spike index. It's up, you know, 97% of the EPSP show bursts. And of course, here's the LTP baseline and then after this sort of stimulation protocol. And what I really expected was that for these S2 synapses, this other group of synapses, what are they seeing? They're seeing this comes before them, then that, and then they're quiet. They don't do anything, right? So here's that. Here's that same sort of portion of this triplet pattern. I didn't think that these S2 synapses would do anything, but that's not what happened. They actually show robust potentiation as well, even though they were quiet when this other group of synapses was producing all of this postsynaptic complex spike bursting. I think that's an eligibility trace, that this pattern of activity didn't produce much LTP on its own, but that, those synapses are now in a different state. And if other groups of synapses onto the same cell trigger complex spike bursting, that sort of updates the eligibility trace, it enables these synapses to undergo LTP. Now I played around a bit with that. And this is a very busy slide. I promise I won't go through all the details, but you can see what I'm doing here. I just took that triplet and pulled it apart, right? Introduce a time gap of two seconds, or in this case, four seconds. And during this last bout here, there's nice bursting, and you see these S2 synapses, yep, they update, they potentiate. Here at four seconds, again, you get potentiation. It's only you get out here to eight seconds, and now, okay, everything seems to be over. So it seems as though, and here's just a plot again showing all the experiments, or the results from all experiments, that even with a gap of four seconds, right? these synapses that are where I think an eligibility trace has been set, that they can respond to other synapses causing a cell to fire complex spike bursts and undergo long-term potentiation. There's some other interesting things going on in there, but uh, we can come back to that at the end if anybody's interested. Uh, okay, and then just finally, I'm actually getting through this a lot quicker than I thought I would. Um, and this is, these aren't experiments from last summer. These are experiments that I did uh, just before the, the lab ramp down back in March. And I was interested in this idea of NMDA receptor signaling complexes and what role they might have in some of this weird behavior I was, I'm seeing uh, with data frequency induced LTP. Uh, and so I took advantage of some genetic mutants that were generated in Seth Grant's lab that disrupt NMDA receptor signaling complexes. Here's the idea of us NMDA receptor signaling complex. NMDA receptors are constructed, they're heteromeric receptors. They've got four subunits. There's two obligatory glu N1 subunits, and then they have different combinations of these glu N2A or glu N2B, and there's others as well. But they come along four at a time to form a functional glutamate activated NMDA type receptor. These glu N2A subunits, and the 2B subunits. They have very long C-terminal domains that hang out in the cytoplasm, and they can bind to and interact with a family of adapter proteins known as MOGUX, or membrane-associated guanylate kinases. Those are proteins like SAP102, PSD95, PSD93. And these proteins, in turn, have multiple protein interaction domains that can bind to a host of signaling molecules, downstream signaling molecules. This slide, this portion of the slide is very out of date. We now know there are 50 different proteins at the excitatory, at excitatory synapses that can couple through the MOGUX to NMDA receptors. And the idea is you build sort of a complex of proteins. So here's our NMDA receptor subunits and through these glu N2 subunits binding to these MOGUX, that's this sort of egg-shaped structure here. And then all these other signaling molecules get clustered into the complex. And the idea is you're strategically positioning the downstream signaling molecules right at the NMDA receptor, where they can respond to increases in calcium as those receptors activate and coordinate signaling to regulate the induction of long-term potentiation and long-term depression. So that's sort of the basis of the model. Some work done in Seth Grant's lab by Renee Hen uh, showed some of the rules that are important for putting these NMDA receptor signaling complexes together. 
And what Rene was doing in the experiments that are shown here is he's doing something called uh, blue native gel electrophoresis. So you know, many of you have seen sort of Western blots where you're resolving proteins based on their molecular weight. This is kind of like that, except it's done under non-reducing uh, uh, conditions. So that all the proteins that are gathered up in the complexes, they, they stay together, right? And here he's taking extract from mouse forebrain, he's running it out on these blue native gels, and then probing the blots with antibodies that recognize gluN1 or gluN2A subunits or the gluN2B subunits of the NMDA receptors. And he sees these sort of two populations of NMDA receptors that run at very high molecular weights. There's one at 0.8 megadaltons and another group of, uh, of proteins that run at 1.5 megadaltons. So it's not kilodaltons, it's megadaltons. The little Purple bars here are showing the molecular weights of the individual subunits for GLUA1 and GLUA2 and GLUA2. So basically, he's directly visualized these NMDA receptor signaling complexes. One of the things he did was to take advantage of a mutant mouse that was generated by Tomas Ryan when he was a graduate student in SAS lab. And the mouse that, that Tomas generated was to basically delete, get rid of the C terminal domain of either the GLUN2B subunits. Right. or the glue into a subunit. So just get rid of their C terminus and do that by sort of swapping out. Right? So get rid of the C terminal domain of the glue into B subunits of NMDA receptors by replacing it with the C terminal domain of the 2A subunit. That seems like com kind of complicated. Like why would you go to all that kind of rigmarole to get rid of the 2B C terminus? It turns out if you make a global knockout mouse of glue into B subunits or mice globally homozygous for just a deletion mutant of the glue N2B C terminus, those, those are lethal mutations. Those animals die on uh, postnatal day one, right? But these animals survive. And he also made the corresponding mutant where he put in the 2B C terminal tail on the, CA, uh, on the glue N2A subunits. And look what happens. If you get rid of the C terminal domain of the uh, glue N2B subunits of NMDA receptors, these high order 1.5 megadalton complexes of NMDA receptors, it just falls apart, right? The lower group here, this 0.8 megadalton complex, that corresponds to just four subunits coming together to make an NMDA receptor, that's just fine. So I thought this is cool. This is a great way I've just disrupted the NMDA receptor signaling complex, or, or Tomas and Rene have and to use these animals to look at both Hebbian and Neo-Hebbian plasticity. Right? I don't have, well, I have it, I think, but I'm not gonna show it to you. But you, know, you might worry at first, like, well, if you do this and you bust up these complexes of NMDA receptors, do they appropriately target to the synapse? And the answer is, yeah, they do. If you look at NMDA receptor-mediated synaptic currents, they're fine in these mutants. I looked at Hebbian LTP in these mutants, just using a conventional, uh, high frequency stimulation protocol, so a 100 hertz protocol that was repeated twice. So this is sort of high frequency single spiking, not a burst. Again, using two pathways, recording from using two pathways. And you can see the pathway that gets sort of the set of synapses that gets the high frequency stimulation undergoes LTP, not the other unstimulated group of synapses here in wild type. And here in those mutants where the NMDA receptor signaling complexes are gone, Heavy and LTP is fine, right? High frequency stimulation induced LTP is just fine. Here's five hertz for five seconds, so not long enough to produce a burst, right? But it does produce short-term potentiation, and that also looks identical in the mutants. So NMDA receptor currents, heavy and LTP, just those naked NMDA receptors that aren't really associated with those higher order complexes, they work just fine, right? But here's what happens to the neo heavy and LTP. So I've done a lot of these experiments. I'm just gonna show you one, one set of them. Here I'm using that triplet protocol, right? Where I introduce a four second delay after stimulate S1, then S2, then wait four seconds, return to this group of synapses, right? And ask what happens to synaptic strength, right? Now I'm plotting things a little bit differently here. Here on this plot is just showing what's happening to these S1 synapses after they receive this stimulation pattern in wild type and in mutant. And you can see the mutants, there's a strong deficit in plus, or potentiation here. Here's the S2 path synapses, right? These guys. This is where I think there's an eligibility trace being set that gets updated by the bursting that's triggered when we return to this 
other group of synapses. And you can see in wild type, we get nice potentiation there. And again, LTP is completely disrupted in these newtons. This plot's up here, I won't go through the details, it's just looking at the bursting, documenting the bursting that occurs during these different patterns of stimulation. And you can see they're fine, there's no problem with the bursting. Uh, but the potentiation induced, the neohebian type potentiation is strongly, and it looks like selectively disrupted in these newtons. I've done a lot of, not a lot, but I've done other protocols. And if everything is tightly coupled, right, if one, bout of stimulation immediately follows the other, these mutants seem fine. It's only when you start to introduce gaps, right? Whenever there's a time gap between activation of these different groups of synapses, that's when the plasticity just seems to fall apart. So I'm gonna end there, uh, leave us plenty of time for questions and, and summarize. So I think synapses are smart. They're not sort of constrained by you know, simple two-factor heavy in plasticity that only works on a millisecond sort of time scale. There's mechanisms at, pl at place that allow uh, synapses to detect patterns of activity that span seconds right, and regulate the induction of LTP. And I think the postsynaptic complex spike bursting is really the thing that enables all of this. The synapses are able to cooperate based on these activity-dependent mechanisms that I don't know what they are yet that drive the transition into the bursting mode and allow it to persist for a while. Synapses can cooperate based on that sort of process. Right? The idea of cooperativity in LTP, in heavy in LTP, is as old as LTP is. Bliss and Lomo, in their original description of long-term potentiation way back in the 60s, noted that there was this sort of cooperative aspect of LTP induction. And the idea was if you use a very low stimulation strength and only activate a few presynaptic fibers, you do high frequency stimulation, you don't get much LTP. Now, if you use stronger stimulation, activate a lot of axons, a lot more excitatory synapses, do high frequency stimulation, now, boom, you get robust LTP. And the idea is that synapses kind of cooperate with one another, more and more active simultaneously, synchronously, the stronger the LTP is that occurs. That cooperativity, though, is heavy and it's occurring, it has to be coincident, synchronous activation of those synapses. And what we're seeing here, or what I think we're seeing here in this complex spike bursting, is that spreading that cooperative property of LTP out over behavioral timescales. And then the other thing that we see is that some patterns of activity that produce this complex spike bursting actually ends up producing a sort of competitive interaction between the synapses. That if one group of synapses had a lot of activity, produce a lot of complex spike bursting, they sort of take all the credit for that. All the associated strength comes to that, it's to them. It's almost like a winner take all kind of mechanism that yeah, another group of synapses are now active, but only for a little bit, they don't potentiate. They can't take advantage of this sort of cooperative process that's being uh, induced. And the other, finally, or next, uh, yeah, finally, I think, you know, there's the idea, I think we're seeing something like eligibility traces, that some patterns of theta frequency stimulation distributed over multiple synapses have very little lasting effect on synaptic strength, but somehow those synapses now are receptive to bursting generated by other synapses, right? And if that occurs within a few seconds, right, those synapses will update and undergo LTP. And then finally, the idea that these NMDA receptor signaling complexes had a crucial, maybe a special role in neo heavy and plasticity. Um, that's a pretty strong statement to make. Certainly in those mutants, the NMDA receptor complexes are just gone. They've been disrupted completely. Um, but there are sites within the C-terminus of the GLU-N2B subunit of NMDA receptors, unique phosphorylation sites that regulate NMDA receptor activity. There's this binding site on that C-terminus of the GLU-N2B subunit that binds CAM kinase 2 a protein kinase that we know has important roles in LTP. So those are gone too, right? It's not like we're only disrupting the complexes, but we're doing other things to the NMDA receptor through that mutation. So it'll take some work to sort of sort all that out. But given the, the, the effect size, the phenotype size, I think it'll be a fun set of experiments to, to work through. And then finally, before I take questions, I just want to say thanks. Walton Dean, uh, I've had a lot, several, really good discussions with them and have gotten some ideas for them. Same for Marcella Koba at USC, and then Seth Grant and Oboro at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, I've collaborated with both of them for many, many years. Noboro is providing the, the, the 
NMDA receptor mutant mice that we'll be using in, in experiments to study the role of these complexes in neohead plasticity. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great. Thank you, Tom. Uh, that, that, was, that was really, really stimulating. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, we, we have a number of questions to begin in the, uh, in the chat. So um, if, if you would have a peep and look, the, the first of these comes from Ryan Golden. Um, and, and his question is, uh, does the competitive overshadowing effect of the first stimulus hold if the second stimulus is as strong as the first? Uh, in other words, is it a consequence of the relative difference between stimulus intensities, or is it a consequence of cellular fatigue or res uh, resource sequestering that occurs anytime the first stimulus is sufficiently strong? Uh, and there was a um, response from Michael Fancelow here as well. I, can, you, can you read these, Tom? Yeah, I can see them. Okay. There are a lot of them to get through. So Ryan's question, I think, is a really, really good one. Um, and it's just going to take experiments to sort of sort that out, to start changing the duration of that second bout or activation of that second group of synapses after the ones that came before them were activated for a long period of time and see, you know, what happens. I have no idea. What, I don't have a prediction of what will happen. It's one of the problems I'm having with these experiments is that the parameter space is kind of exploding on me. I mean, you start thinking about intervals and durations and relative timing uh, and making some sense out of all that what are the best experiments to do is kind of is kind of different it's difficult but i think you know ryan's question is a really good one uh, and it's something we just have to wait and see to see what's happening and michael's asking in pavlovian conditioning you still get overshadowing with two equally strong cs's they just partially overshadow each other huh well there's my experiment I'll do 25 seconds on one pathway, 25 seconds of theta frequency on the second pathway, and the prediction would be they would both potentiate, but weakly. Is that right, Michael? I don't know. See, that's the kind of thing I need. Some yeah. models, some ideas that generate a, a hypothesis or a predicted outcome. Uh, boy, it's gonna be hard to get through all these. Ryan says, uh, but what, it, what would be in terms of behavioral response? Oh, that's, that's a good question. I'd leave that to Michael. I'm curious if this biophysical non hebbian phenomenon corresponds to the behavior. Yeah, that, you know, that's a great question too. And that's something else I'm struggling with in these experiments. I, I don't think it's very fruitful because I've tried it and it hasn't worked for me to try to map what we're seeing onto associative learning, CS, US, and all the wonderful things that happen there. Um, at least I haven't had a lot of luck thinking it about it in that way. The other way I've been thinking about, you know, how this patterning and sequential activation of different groups of synapses sort of cooperate to induce LTP is in the place cell formation literature. Uh, CA1 pyramidal cells, they show place specific firing when animals are wandering about within an environment. And the idea there is that, you know, some of the Things that people have studied about how place cells form might actually help inform right what's happening at, at these levels and i'm struggling with that literature it's huge and it's complicated and i need to consult experts uh, to help out with those yeah so david's asking a question david glansman about well-known properties of ltp is synapse specificity what are the implication of the results of these results for that property? I, you know, I think it's still synapse specific, and but there's this mechanism where, you know, cooperativity, where a group of synapses can, as a result of generating this complex spike bursting state, uh, facilitate the ability of other synapses to undergo LTP. And I wonder if it's sort of a thing that might like help build sort of sequential strengthening of synapses. Again, going back to like animals running through a novel environment, they encode one place and then another place and another place. And as they go through that sequence of, of places, you'd get sequential activity across the you know, group of synapses feeding into them that's delivering spatially tuned information. Uh, uh, just so real quick specific, here. But, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was gonna say that in relation to this, Mayank has a, a question below. Play cells usually last about one second. Would these phenomena work if S1 is one second or S2 is one second? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't done that. You know, it takes, takes 10 seconds to get the cells to burst, right? 
And I haven't yet, there again, it comes back to the parameter space. Like what if now on that second set of pathway, instead of second set of synapses, instead of doing five seconds of stimulation, I just did one second of stimulation. Would they still potentiate? That's a great question. I just haven't looked at that. But that brings up another point is that I got to get control of the bursting. You know, I'm just letting the slice and the cells and the circuit do its thing and transition into this complex spike bursting mode. I really want to be able to like make them burst on demand and then get better control, better timing, right? And I think that would help sort of address some of those questions. Oh, Frank Krasny has a great question. Maybe Gina had something like it as well, but the, do external neuromodulators play any role here? I, you know, that's a great question. So I, I have two possibilities that I'm thinking of. One is, you know, that funny, it takes time. It's activity dependent sort of build up into the complex spike bursting. Like what's that, right? And one idea is that with repetitive stimulation, you know, we have noradrenergic and dopaminergic fibers in the slice and maybe you're activating them, getting release of something like norepinephrine, dopamine, some other modulatory transmitter that's actually responsible for kicking the cells into the bursting mode. So, you know, that's easy to address. That's a, that's, and I, I plan to do those sorts of experiments. The other part of that that I think would be interesting to do is to do the patterns of stimulation that appear to induce that eligibility trace. And now instead of activating the second pathway to trigger bursting to see if it updates, give a pulse of dopamine or norepinephrine one second or two seconds or four seconds later and see if well, modulatory neurotransmitter all by itself is able to update those eligibility traces and cause the synapses to potentiate. Uh, yeah, David's asking, do you see these phenomena in the intact hippocampus? You certainly see complex spike bursting occurring in the hippocampus and in the intact hippocampus. It's sort of a signature sort of action potential firing generation that, that you see in terms of the plasticity uh, and whether, you know, bursts in a neohebian type of plasticity is occurring in vivo. Actually, from Jeff McGee's lab, that's sort of what got me interested in these experiments. They found that, you know, they could actually induce a dendritic plateau potential and complex spike burst in the cell. And that was sufficient to induce a new place cell, right, in the cell that they were, or place field in the cell that they were recording from. So there's a lot of similarities between what I'm seeing in these experiments and some of the, the plasticity that, that Jeff's lab has seen in vivo and also in vitro. They call it behavioral timescale plasticity because it has this feature of you know, synaptic interactions and LTP induction over seconds rather than milliseconds. Yeah, Ryan Golding asked whether acetylcholine facilitates bur bursting in the hippocampus. And this helps with short-term durations of place cells. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, that's another strong candidate neuromodulator that could facilitate complex spike bursting. I think I'll do an experiment where I just add a cocktail of noradrenergic, dopaminergic, and cholinergic blockers do the five hertz stimulation and see if the bursting fails. And if that works, then I'll dissect the cocktail and figure out what's going on. Uh, how are we doing on time? Oh, we, we still have uh, five minutes. I think Gina asked the same question about ACH, uh, mm -hmm. norepinephrine and dopamine, serotonin. Yeah, I haven't done the experiment of like having those ag agonists of the receptors present uh, during these, the, these sort of neo stimulation patterns. And part of the reason I haven't done that yet is that, you know, Gina knows, we've, in my lab forever, Shikabe has done a, a bunch of experiments when he was a graduate student in the lab, looking at noradrenergic modulation of this state of stimulation induced LTP, and it's powerful. You do five hertz for five seconds by itself, doesn't do anything. You put on isoproteranol beta adrenergic receptor uh, agonist, and boom, you get big LTP. Uh, but it would be interesting to see whether dopamine or acetylcholine or other uh, uh, modulatory transmitters don't by themselves facilitate you know the, the potentiation but instead selectively regulate right the bursting and and uh, plasticity or potentiation that's induced by the pattern stimulation not just the you know the short duration of five hertz stimulation alone 
Sorry, I'm jumping around here. Here's one from Dean. Metabotropic receptors are candidates to span the second scale. Could the eligibility trace be GABA B mediated depression of GABA A or M glu or, or M glu R? Yeah, that's a great question, Dean. That's an experiment I plan for the summer. Um, you know, one of the things that we've seen in the lab is during these five hertz trains of stimulation, if you record from a CA1 pyramidal cell and specifically look at the iPSCs, the inhibitory postsynaptic currents, they fade away. They kind of melt away. And that's uh, something that Graham Collingridge discovered back in the 80s or so. So you get this sort of down regulation of feed forward inhibition. And I think that might play a key role in allowing the bursting to emerge. I haven't, we haven't looked at, you know, once you've induced that sort of theta frequency induced depression of feed forward inhibition, never look to see like how long does it take to recover yeah. and I mean, whether or not. Could, that could be an eligibility trace in and of itself, Tom. Yeah, yeah, it really could, which is kind of, I think, equally interesting, right? It's not eligibility trace in the sort of conventional meaning of yeah. it, but it's sort of, and that brings me back to, to another idea. I don't know if I like the, the term neo-heavy. Uh, I don't know if this really fits what people are thinking about when they say neo heavy and three factor learning rules. Uh, you know, what really, could, what really might be happening here is sort of a dynamic or activity dependent interaction between you know, short term facilitation at excitatory synapses, short term depression at inhibitory synapses, you know, plasticity of intrinsic excitability that's causing the cells to burst. And it's sort of all these multiple different types of plasticity sort of working together. Uh, to regulate LTP induction, which I think is just as interesting. You know, so, long, so many people, including myself, we study LTP or we study LTB or we study plasticity of intrinsic excitability and thinking about how all those different forms of plasticity might interact with one another during, during different patterns of stimulation. You know, it could get some interesting things like I think what we're seeing here coming out of just that alone. Let's Carlos say, oh, thanks for the data or for the comments on the data, Carlos. Yeah, optogenetics and in vivo calcium imaging. Yeah, there's so much to do here. Oh, no, you're, are you knocking those? <laughs> he is. So you can still do interesting experiments with only extracellular recordings from the hippocampal slice preparation. But no, actually, I've been thinking that uh, you know, optogenetics, wouldn't it be nice to have, you know, optogenetic activation of neuroadrenergic or dopaminergic inputs and use flashes of light during these patterns of stimulation to sort of more closely mimic what might be happening in vivo. And also this idea of the bursting and it's being generated by a dendritic plateau potential. Um, I, you know, I'd love to see that, right? See what's happening in the dendrite itself, seeing whether they're when these complex spike bursts are occurring, whether there really is a sort of a plateau potential in the dendrite. That I think we can do. I was thinking about in vivo calcium imaging. I think it'd be easier just to patch a dendrite, do the five hertz stimulation and see what happens. That, that could be a fairly short, uh, for, you know, easily done experiment. Uh, sorry, I'm jumping around again. Oh, so my ank. Uh, has a, I don't know, this is a question for Frank. CA1 has little recurrent connection. Um, so there may not be much direct effect of one neuron activity on the other. So I think that may be a response to somebody else's question. But Mike asks, is inhibition blocked in the slice? No, it's not, right? There's no picrotoxin. We're just letting the slice do its thing under, under normal con conditions. So yeah, we do see this happening in the presence of intact inhibition within the slice. Now the caveat there, I think I mentioned earlier, is that I think beta frequency stimulation triggers a reduction in activity dependent depression of feed forward inhibition. So the, the circuit in the cells and the synapses may be down regulating inhibition uh, for us. That's awesome, Tom. Uh, one minor, another request, this is really awesome. Someday I will convince people that theta is eight hertz, not five. Hertz. Yes, I think of you. I think of you every now and then. My exactly that. <laughs> you know, I've done so many experiments with eight hertz or five hertz. I don't want to go do them all over again at eight. But it would be interesting to, to look. Uh, you know, that's another parameter that could affect the outcome of how synapses are interacting with one another. It'll help your case actually if you use one one second stimulation in eight hertz. In eight that packs in a lot more pulses. And now we don't yeah. need 10 second stimulation. So there you go. 
Yeah, no, that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> I just wrote that down. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know how next week, how it went. Yeah. Really it yeah. Oh, Stuart Lipton's on. Uh, rather than an extrinsic neuromodulator, couldn't a neo-Hebbian effect be due to differential intracellular molecular signaling via the C-terminal domains of GLUN2B and GLUN2A? Uh, based on work from Hilmar Batting and others. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, that's a really good point. So I think the idea there is that, you know, these complexes, if you look at the weight, the molecular weight of that complex, it's 1.5 megadaltons, and then you look at the number of proteins that we know can bind through PSD95 and PSD93 to NMDA receptors, you know, 50, that 1.5 megadaltons, you can't fit all of those proteins into one complex, right? So there's a lot of heterogeneity in the protein composition of these NMDA receptor signaling complexes. And there is an idea that the 2A and the 2B subunits of the NMDA receptors might be able to couple two distinct MAGA proteins and build different types of NMDA receptor signaling complexes. And so I think Stuart's point is a really good one, that one of the things we might be seeing in those animals is that, you know, we've disrupted the gluen 2 b dependent NMDA receptor signaling complexes, and that a different complex is due to the 2A C-terminal domains, um, might have different signaling properties and be contributing in different ways to, to the neo and LTP. You know, I really want to get those mutants, the gluen 2 a mutants, where the C-terminal domain of the 2A subunit has been deleted and replaced with 2B, because that type of experiment, looking at plasticity in those mutants would be really interesting to see how the phenotype compares to, to the mutants we have looked at. But with the recent you know, lab shutdowns and whatnot, I think it's going to be a while before we can get any of these mutants shipped from Edinburgh to Los Angeles. So those experiments are on hold for a while. Hey, Mark Thomas is on. Hey, Mark. So Mark Thomas is a former, actually first graduate student in my lab. And Mark was the one who discovered theta frequency induced complex spike bursting. And I've been following it ever since. So he deserves a lot of credit in terms of the background of these experiments. I remember when Mark did discovered that this complex spike bursting LTP, and he was doing the experiments doing five Hertz stimulation. We were doing long trains. We'd go for like three minutes and that would produce you know, a pretty little bit of LTP. Now I won't go into the details of why that is the case, but Mark noticed this complex spike bursting occurring and thought, hmm, I wonder if I just stop the train during this complex spike bursting phase that's getting induced, what happens? And when he did that experiment, it was just a gee whiz, I wonder what would happen if I, and he did that and saw potentiation get induced. And when I first saw that, I didn't believe it because it didn't quite go with what you know, how we thought at the time, thought about LTP induction. He was actually using like 30 seconds of stimulation instead of three minutes of stimulation. And the old view in the LTP world was more stimulation means more LTP, right? And Mark was seeing something very different than that. But boy, he was right. And I've been working on it. We've been working on it ever since. Um, Fun to see. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> it's a benefit of COVID, you know. I wouldn't be able to peek in on this kind of thing, but Gina <laughs> invited me. So. Oh, nice! Thanks, Gina. <laughs> yeah, it's been fun. One of the one of the few benefits of COVID. <laughs> well, so I also have uh, the computer at the rig set up with a webcam, so I can do experiments and go to meetings at the same time. So that's another. <laughs> that benefit. sounds like you. <laughs> All right, see ya. Uh, I don't know, so we're, we're, we're way over the hour. Uh, there are lots of questions here. I think Joe said he's gonna keep track of the questions. He'll have a copy of the questions uh, that he can send me later. So I'll look through them and, uh, and uh, email, get back to any of you, uh, if you if you'd like. Sure. All right. All right, bye everyone. Thanks for coming by. Thanks so much, Kyle. That was wonderful. All right, bye bye. <laughs>